Okay, I warn you in advance, this is going to be uh, quite theoretical, uh, as is my nature. Um, but hopefully, I mean, my aim here is to say things that people in the room think are interesting and thought provoking and that we can have discussions about. Uh, so let's see how that goes. Um, so fundamentally, a concept that's come up repeatedly during the course of these two days is this notion of biomimicry, right? So designing, um, I know there's, there's, there's people in the room who really, your, your career aim is understanding how, uh, how the cochlear functions, the perhaps other half of people in the room, our aim is to, and I include myself in this, uh, design structures that uh, replicate how it functions. The motivation being that you know, nature is really good at coming up with very innovative, creative solutions to very difficult problems. So instead of trying to beat those solutions, let's just copy them uh, and see what comes out of it. And there are some very famous examples of biomimicry doing, uh, doing very impressive things. Uh, examples people like to cite are the Japanese bullet trains, uh, sort of allegedly were inspired by um, bird beaks, uh, Velcro is a, a widely cited example. Um, and then uh, buildings that um, have sort of passive ventilation systems just based on heat flux uh, inspired by um, termite mounds. And so in particular, the kind of three-way exchange of ideas that I want to talk about today uh, looks like this. Uh, so, so for some context, you know, we are people that work on metamaterials. And so we start off in that corner. And then we found ourselves found ourselves starting to work on uh, some bio-inspired things, in particular cochlear-inspired things, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. So we found ourselves trying to do this, this exchange. And then more recently, we sort of went, well, we've got this metamaterial that's filtering sounds. Okay, well, there's lots of people spend a lot of time doing essentially that problem with computational algorithms. Uh, can we add that into the, the triangle? Um, and in particular, our aim being, as I said, as we are, as we say, theoreticians, mathematicians in, in particular, can we come up with some nice mathematical framework in which, within which this exchange of ideas can uh, be done, well, ideally, in some systematic way? And so in this talk, I'm going to talk about, um, I've been the first bit talking about our work on, on cochlear-inspired materials. Some to quite a few things you've heard over the last 24 hours. And then in the second, the second part, I'll move on to talking about some of the sort of signal processing things we've been working on more recently. And I will flag up that this is, so here, these are all kind of quite recent unpublished results uh, that I'm keen to share with this group. and look forward to your comments, suggestions, and, and feedback. And so this is, these are collaborations with a whole bunch of people. Um, lots of it with, with Habib, who was my supervisor when I was based at ETH, uh, and then lots of other members of our, of our group. Uh, and I'm funded by Bahim, uh, who've been mentioned already. So the physical setting that, when we think about our metamaterial, the physical setting that we're thinking about is one of based on this concept of minute resonance. So minute resonance is the resonance of a, an air bubble in water. So because, because the material parameters of air are so different from those of water, it acts as a very, very strong scatter of sound. And we're going to use this resonance, in particular this sub-wavelength resonance, so it scatters, it resonates at uh, wavelengths that are much greater than its size. Uh, we're going to use this as the building blocks of the material that we're going to consider. And a question that always comes up when I say that is, well, how on earth do you build that thing? Uh, and the answer is twofold. Firstly, that I, I don't. Um, but secondly, other people uh, do, albeit to some extent, and I'd like to show this picture from this very nice paper that's uh, over a decade old now. And what they're doing is they're injecting gas bubbles into a, um, a silicon-based gel, the relatively high viscosity of which means that the bubbles hold its shape. Um, and in a, a series of papers, they showed some of the, essentially some of the, um, some of the crucial observations that we expect these bubble structures to have could be replicated uh, by this uh, in the lab with this structure. Uh, so there is some hope for building things, for building these things, is the point I want to make. 
So I will keep the mathematics to, despite my uh, uh, urges, I will keep the mathematics to a minimum, um, but I would be remiss of me not to show the problem that we're solving, which is a Helmholtz scattering problem. So we're considering we're doing this in the frequency domain. We're considering the propagation of time harmonic waves. And we have a geometry where we have some background medium, the water, and we have some material inclusions, uh, so some roughly spherical things that contain the air. Uh, we're interested in, to, in how this object scatters the sound. Uh, and a point to make about why we think this structure is, even though this structure is clearly very hard to build, why we think it's worth thinking about is because of this, uh, the dimensions of this thing. Uh, so it's come up a couple of times during the course of these couple of days. Oh, these, these cochlear metamaterials tend to be quite, quite large, like over a meter, whereas the cochlear is quite small. Uh, these high contrast resonators are a very natural example of something that resonates at the kind of scale that we would want if we were going to build something that was a couple of centimeters long. Um, okay, uh, and so the key like mathematical subtlety that's going to be our way into this you know, we we uh, are not simulation guys. We don't want to do very expensive um, simulations. Instead, we want to do something that, dare I say, is mathematically elegant. I will let you be the judge of that, but that's that's the dream. Um, the key parameter is this delta. So this delta appears in, this is the continuity of flux on the boundary of the resonators. And delta is uh, the ratio of the density inside and outside. So ratio of the density of air and water, something like 10 to the minus three. Uh, so crucially, we've got some small parameter uh, and this is gonna be our asymptotic parameter that allows us to make um, approximations and understand how the system behaves. And in particular, we're interested in understanding the uh, low frequency resonance of the system. Uh, and so our asymptotic method is gonna say, is gonna be to say, well, we think delta, we were interested in the case where delta is small, so let's let delta be asymptotically small. And then we want to consider uh, resonant modes, the so solutions to this problem, uh, in the case when the frequency converges to zero as a function of delta. So low frequency solutions. And when we do that, uh, this is these, the next two slides are the most mathematically involved, and then it's just pictures. So bear with me. Um, but the key point of our uh, asymptotic method is that when we do this, we end up with a characterization of these resonant modes in terms of the eigenstates of a matrix. So that's good news because that's easy to understand. And the matrix we get is this one on the right, um, which uh, I won't, won't dwell on the, the details of, but it's, it has some, some operator S is this, this uh, single layer potential that appears in scattering theory uh, quite a bit, applying an inverse of it and doing some integrals. Uh, I say details not so important. Maybe the one thing to flag up is that this, what we're calling the generalized capacitance matrix, this object, that's our key thing, um, is a generalization of a concept that is very well established, particularly in uh, electrostatics. Indeed, it was originally introduced by Maxwell uh, well over a century ago uh, to study how uh, a system of conductors it describes the relationship between the potential and charge on a system of conductors. Uh, so the analogy with our scattering problem here, our acoustic scattering problem, is, um, is apparent. So this matrix, which has some technical details, but fundamentally is just an N by N matrix, where N is the number of resonators we have, uh, is very useful because it allows us to, in particular, have this result down here. So at the top here, I'm just recalling the definition of these uh, resonant modes we're looking for, which are the ones for which the frequency goes to zero as this parameter delta goes to zero. And then we have, firstly, a statement that says so these, these modes that go to zero as delta goes to zero, well, if you have n resonators, you have n of them with positive real parts, which is nice. We know they exist. And then we can find a formula for them. And that formula is one that says just at leading order, in this parameter delta, the resonant frequency is just the eigenvalue of this generalized capacitance matrix. And so this is nice because now all of a sudden, if we want to understand how this structure um, resonates in response to incoming sound waves, we're just doing eigenvalues of, of matrices. 
And so this is uh, this plot is to convince you that this is you know this this all this uh, relatively sophisticated machinery I've introduced is worthwhile. Is so on the, here we've got uh, a system of what is it eight resonators, so reson reasonably small. But I'm computing the resonant frequencies. Uh, the crosses are uh, using a, a multiple expansion method, so a, a reasonably classical numerical method, uh, and that took about 40 seconds on my laptop. Uh, whereas when I do it using our asymptotic formulation, because I'm not having to do any numerical optimization or root finding, it's I mean it's orders of magnitudes uh, better. Uh, and I mean, okay, you, you can take these precise numbers with a pinch of salt because this obviously depends on the extent to which I optimize my code. Um, but hopefully this convinces you that doing asymptotic things uh, can make your life a lot easier if you know what you're doing. And then one other comment to make very briefly before I move on to pictures is, okay, we've got, so we've got this matrix, the eigenvalues of this matrix give the resonant frequencies, or well, the eigenvectors of this matrix, the Vs, give us the associated resonant modes. So it tells us when when the system is resonating at this frequency, here's what the the scattered wave field looks like, and that's the eigenvectors of the matrix. Okay, so let's uh, use this to try and do some cochlear things. So a question you might ask, uh, particularly when you see all the exciting things that people in the room are doing, is uh, can you design a graded structure that, in the kind of sense that we've been talking about, replicates the cochlea? Uh, and so on the left here we have a picture that. Uh, is um, uh, is quite similar to the kind of pictures that we saw in uh, Vinicius's talk yesterday. We've, um, uh, so I should say, we've the the frequency and position are non-dimensionalized here, uh, which I guess I should apologize for. But uh, nonetheless, what we've done here is the same kind of optimization problem that the Vinicius was talking about yesterday. Uh, so the red is uh, the kind of uh, logarithmic tonotopic map that we expect to see. And then we're we're able to uh, fit the um, fit the distribution of the resonators so that the resonant frequencies, which are the crosses, so these are the eigenvalues of my matrix, fit the curve uh, reasonably well. And then just brief comment on the the right hand picture. Um, this has been picked up on a few times, so I won't say very much. But as you, this is evolution with time. Uh, going down the going down the page. Uh, and I apologize that my uh, nice video I used to have has been corrupted. I've not had time to redo it. So we'll have to deal with this for now. Uh, but you see, as we saw with all the other graded structures, um, that you have uh, a wave peak moving from left to right, peak amplitude moving from left to right with decreasing wavelength uh, up to the point at which it, um, it uh, it's group velocity stalls. And then the uh, that's where the, the localization happens. Okay. Uh, so, using our asymptotic method, we've designed something that, in some sense, replicates the cochlea. We can, in this nice mathematical framework, we can do uh, all sorts of other things. Uh, so, for example, because we're just doing symbols on a page or things in a computer, adding in amplification is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, how to do it in the lab is a question that I do not know how to answer, and for that reason, I will not spend much time on this page. Um, but at least it's a, a fun game you can spend some time on, adding in a forcing term and nonlinear forcing term. And in particular, the, the pictures I'm showing here are for uh, a similar nonlinear forcing term that, uh, to what Fabrice spoke about this morning. So something that gives a Hopf bifurcation. And you see the kind of amplification that you would expect that's uh, level dependent. Um, and you can also make some stability plots to understand. So these are a phase space diagram. Uh, for the so R is the the amplitude of our solution, and um, we either side of the bifurcation we see that the the limit cycles are stable, um, so we should have some stability. Okay, uh, so there's quite a bit of my time talking about talking about that. Uh, I would like to um, add in the uh, relation with potential computational algorithms, um, and so. A, the, the story of how we got started there was essentially this. So we, as I say, we realized that we had a, a structure that is in some sense filtering sounds in a similar way to how the cochlea does it. So let's try and 
we've got this in our computer, let's use this as a signal processing uh, architecture. Uh, and then our result here is that, uh, quite a bit of text in this slide, but crucially the pressure fields of, uh, if we switch to the time domain under some, some reasonably strong assumptions that allow us to do an inverse Fourier transform, we get a modal decomposition. So these are again our, our friends, the resonant modes. Uh, but the time varying the time varying coefficients are given by convolution of the incoming wave with these uh, these HNs, which it turns out are uh, first order gamma tones. And so here we, you know, having seen some of the some of the literature, a few some of which I've listed here, I'm aware that gamma tones keep cropping up as um, what I've written here, uh, mimicking the human auditory system well. And I'm aware from, there's a, a discussion to be had that about what your uh, choice of kernel might be, uh, which is not for now. Uh, but the point I wanna make here is we, so we were doing metamaterials, Cochrane inspired metamaterials. Uh, and then at some point we stumble across uh, an expression that looks a bit like something that other people have said, and I mean, and Dick Lyon who spoke yesterday has a whole chapter in his book about gamma tone kernels and their ability to replicate human auditory processing. Uh, so we stumble across this result that says, uh, oh, actually our structure is behaving in a similar way to how other people seem to think uh, is a, roughly speaking, a good way to replicate human auditory processing, at least the, in the uh, auditory periphery. And so then the game we thought we play is, well, can we build additional steps on there? And so one thing we've been playing around with, and here's where I start showing you occasionally speculative ideas and, and look forward to discussions about them. So one idea we've been playing around with is, well, so there's this class of sounds, natural sounds, which we know that um, humans are particularly well adapted to, to hearing in various senses. Um, and we also observe that these, uh, these natural sounds have certain statistical properties uh, given. So they satisfy certain distributions um, where you, I mean, maybe it's not worth going into the details, but if you take the, uh, like the, the time varying amplitude and then you, you take the log of it and you average it, you get a distribution that looks like this. So the, the blue curves here are the data for a recording of a trumpet playing. Um, and then you can fit distributions like so. These are from uh, these papers by, by Voss and Clark. And so here what we've got is we've got some, what this is telling us is if we take uh, sounds that humans are good at hearing, then you have some statistical properties which are captured by some relatively small number of parameters. So alpha and beta here, we've got a gamma here. We've got two more parameters in the end here. And so a question that we asked ourselves was, so these parameters, do they contain something useful, significant about the sound? Oops. Uh, and so as a, um, a first experiment, we thought, well, let's do a musical instrument classification. So we took these uh, 10 different musical instruments, recordings of them playing, uh, you can compute some reference values and then you can try and do classification um, by doing it as crudely as possible here. Um, just a dictionary, just a dictionary learning uh, based approach. Uh, and you see that the classification rate we come out with is about a third, uh, which is nothing to get too excited about. But the um, thing I'm taking away from this is the these natural sound parameters seem to contain something. You know, if 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 these uh, these so these are global parameters, they're time independent because we've averaged over time, uh, and so we don't expect them to um, uh, to do a particularly good job of classifying sounds. So for example, a piano is a classical example of because it's a, the strike and decay is very characteristic. That's that's the kind of thing we recognise as a instantly makes you realise it's a piano. To give an example, so we don't expect these global parameters to be perfect, but they seem to contain. Uh, something. Um, and so our, our next point of call will be to, to you know, add this into uh, a method, or a, a signal representation that takes into account time varying things, uh, and see if this in some sense gives either a more effective classification strategy, or uh, a more um, concise, a lower dimensional classification strategy. 
Um, because the, the thing the thing that you could maybe get a little bit excited about from this from these results is that okay, we've got a 30% classification rate, but with this is with a six-dimensional vector. Um, so a very, very low dimensional representation. And then the other thing we've been playing around with recently is um, the use of random projections. Uh, so this is not really motivated so much by human auditory processing, uh, which is part of why I will mention it quite briefly. Um, this is motivated by uh, this work on uh, the fruit fly and the, the, fruit fr the fruit fly's olfactory system, so it's a sense of smell, uh, is reasonably well understood. And in particular, it's understood that um, the, the fruit fly uh, has uh, connections between neurons that firstly randomly increase the number of dimensions very significantly and then truncate all the small values. So let me rephrase that uh, like so. So the kind of mo the motivated algorithm that we deduce from that is if you're given some vector S that you want to classify, you uh, multiply it by a random matrix. Uh, in the case of the fruit fly, this random matrix is one where it's all zero, apart from in each row, you have six ones uh, in random positions. Um, we, in order to take advantage of some, some symmetry properties, we instead chose something that's the difference of two Bernoulli random variables. So these are random variables that take uh, one with probability P and zero with probability one minus P. So you do that multiplication, uh, you do it in such a way where uh, M is rectangular. So you significantly increase the dimension. Uh, so S is, in the experiments I'll show you on the next slide, S has dimension about 400. And then after we multiply, it's uh, a couple of thousand. And then once you've got this very big uh, vector, you then apply this cap operation, uh, which sets all but the largest K coefficients and largest in magnitude uh, to zero. Uh, so you end up with something that is, is very big, but very sparse. And we were able to, to prove some results describing uh, the extent to which this transform is, uh, is continuous uh, and also um, the likelihood of it being at least the multiplication being invertible. And then similarly, we uh, threw it into um, some uh, classification problems. Here we're doing a slightly different problem, which is uh, musical genre classification, uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, the point remains the same. So on the left, we have uh, two plots where we're varying either the, the two crucial parameters, the distribution parameter of our random matrix and the cap parameter, as this is the number of values we keep after we set all the small ones to zero. Um, and the thing to take away from this is, so the, the dotted line in both plots is uh, the classification success rate we get if we just throw our linear support vector machine, which is the thing we're using to actually do the classification, and I will comment on that in a minute. If we just use this without our bio-inspired algorithm, we get the dotted line. Uh, and then the conclusion from these two plots is that adding our, um, adding our bio-inspired transformation doesn't seem to change the success rate very much. So we haven't messed it up. Uh, and then we look at the plot on the right. Here, my uh, claim is that we appear to, uh, as well as not messing it up, appear to benefit from some enhanced robustness properties. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm adding, when I say I, I mean uh, Nina, this is all her work. Uh, Nina is adding uh, random errors, so Gaussian random errors to this vector before classification. Um, and what we find is that at least when we have the parameters chosen correctly, there's a pretty consistent improvement of a few percentage points in the classification accuracy over uh, the um, the case when we don't have our transformation at all, which is the yellow line. And so comments on where to, to go with this, uh, more experiments. Also, as I say, we're at the moment we're using our transform and then we're feeding it into a support vector machine uh, because this was felt like a natural first thing to try. Uh, a better strategy would be to think about the choice of classification uh, mechanism a bit more carefully. And in particular, can we try and take advantage of the fact that the vector we end up with is big, is, is very sparse, uh, which at the moment is, is not the case. Okay, so on that note, I will wrap it up. Uh, here is this three-way exchange of ideas that I keep coming back to. Um, and I hope I've convinced you that by coming up with these 
uh, nice, reasonably concise asymptotic formulas, it gives us a nice platform to think about how we can jump ideas between the three things. Um, I've run out of time to say anything about robustness, but our most recent work has been understanding the extent to which uh, these structures are robust. So if you change the size or the positions of the resonators, and this is inspired by pictures like, like so, where you see cochlear are you know, completely, at least from my naive perspective, look absolutely ruined. Um, but I'm, I'm told actually you, you can lose a surprisingly large proportion of your hair cells and still function pretty well. Um, does our uh, structure behave similarly? Uh, and we have some theorems that say that, that, that essentially that it does. Uh, and these are numerical results. Um, we can even do, and this is my final slide, we can even do the case inspired by this picture of uh, hair cells being damaged to such an extent that their stereocilia are just destroyed, vanished. Uh, what happens if we remove resonators? And it turns out there's this, this interlacing property whereby um, uh, the, when you remove resonators, the frequencies will stay in between the old ones. The consequence being, if you have lots of frequencies and they're close together, they're not gonna, they're not gonna move very much. Uh, so the conclusion being, uh, these, these structures seem to be uh, pretty robust with respect to errors. And on that note, I will finish uh, here are the references. Um, thank you for listening. <laughs>